You're watching International Pagan Radio, where it's all pagan, all the time. Welcome, 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 everybody, to International Pagan Radio's YouTube channel. I am Cloud the Pagan Rapper, your host. And today, guys, for Artist Spotlight, I have an absolute gem for you all. We have George Nicholas from Carnotus Rising here with us to talk about his music, his artwork, everything that he does. And if you don't know about what this man's doing, especially musically, and you know, I know you've heard him on IPR and you've heard him on other stations as well. If you don't know, you need to know about this gentleman here. So welcome aboard, George. How are you? I'm Rich. Thanks for that. I was on your show. Great to be on. And uh, yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing pretty good. Good, good. So it, it is wonderful for me to get a chance to sit down and talk with you because one of the things that I love most about, you know, hosting these these artist spotlights and speaking with other artists for, for International Pagan Radio is that I get to listen to so many different kinds of music and so many different brands and genres and all of that, you know, with a little pagan twist to it. And, you know, it's absolutely amazing to me the work that you're doing so i hadn't listened to a ton of it but i just started recently listening to to more of your music and i guess the best way that i can sum it up for those of you who haven't heard it is it's very chill it's very laid back it's relaxing it helps you ground and then there are songs that will help you build your energy it's phenomenal work uh very musically very sound very tight um lyrically it's very deep very thoughtful so you're about five albums deep right yep. and so tell me kind of like tell me a little bit about yourself about what you're doing and about what got you into you know starting writing these this music and kind of putting it out there to the world for everybody to hear um right i think in this genre i mean i used to run open mic nights and, and karaoke nights so myself and all my family are very musical some of them are really good singers but that was mainstream but since i was a smaller child um although i'm from liverpool never ever really been interested in um football so i never used to go to football matches i would hang around in green spaces like some kind of weird guy um <laughs> one of the nearest places was a, a large cemetery uh, and i used to go up there sketching and um doing all my artwork only because i used to love the trees up there so from an early age i've had an affinity with green spaces and trees um and i used to write a lot of poetry and stuff about the trees you know about the yew and the ash and the the oak and the elder um I started looking at some of the folklore and i thought you know, when I spoke to my friends that I went to school and grew up with in, in the city of Liverpool, nobody really had a clue what I was talking about. And nobody was really interested. <laughs> they just interested <laughs> in football and doing what, you know, young lads do at the time. But um, I found myself on a path anyway. Um, I just always revered wildlife and nature. So I felt comfortable there. I stayed there. I still have never been to, I'm 66 now. And I still have never been to a football match. I don't intend to. Um, I'm just quite happy in the realms of what I like. Um, and it was very cathartic and chilling for me to be in a green place. And as time went by, I met up with more and more people. Um, I used to go to some festivals and events and I'd read out some of my poetry, which they really liked the words because I'd spend a lot of time and energy on the words more than the music really. So every one of my songs is um, brought into the world in the realm of being a poem. Um, and then I'll add the music on. Because a lot of people around the campfire of nights used to say, we really love this, the words to this. Why don't you make it into a song so we can all indulge and sing, you know, about the topic. Um, so I did. I just started putting the, um, the poems to music. Um, luckily, I've been surrounded by some phenomenally talented people as well um one in particular is my main guy in the band which is phil orm who runs doghouse studio so he's a brilliant all-rounder 
and even from mainstream commercial music. He's in the, the 19s, the, the 60s, used to have a band called uh, the Swinging Blue Jeans, a famous band from Liverpool. Well, yeah. the, the original founder, Ray Ennis, he's still alive. He's still in the Swinging Blue Jeans, but so is my guy out of my band, um, Phil Ohm. He's in it as well. And Carla, who's my back and singer, she's in Swinging Blue Jeans. So this crossover between the music I do and I provide um, is, it's not just pagan musicians. I've got people from all walks of life involved in it and have grown into it and, and love what we do. So we're one big kind of happy family, you know. Um, and we're always bringing people in and out over the years, like Jack Mitchell's come in with some electro violin, <clears throat> gives it a, a special flavor. Uh, we had Martin a couple of years ago played some beautiful flute. So yeah, the whole thing, I'm on a journey at the moment. I'm, I'm just a journey, man. I'm just looking every year is different. You know, this year um, I'll be, well, I've, I've just done a song now called Journeyman for a, one of our guys in the pagan circles that has just passed away, sadly missed. And I've just done a, a song for him. So all the songs, <coughs> they don't really have a generic sound it's not like you think well that's a canonis rising song things are upbeat and um get really hot and cheerful like um wild soul it's, oh, yeah. it's got a, a very fast flowing scenario to it oh, yeah. and then we've got really sad and deeply thought out um i mean my song for halloween is for those who brought us here which is in honor of the ancestors you know i'm not into the, the hollywood aspect of monsters and ghouls and most people about Hollywood, you know, Hollywood, yeah. in my eyes, they're wrong in the stick. It's about communion with people that have been. And so the song, for those who brought us here, is about our ancestors. You know, um, the dance of the ancestors still in the blood, yes, our DNA, and the sense of their presence still here in the mud. And you, you, I, I can, when I go to North Wales and places in Scotland, some of the ancient Celtic places, I just sit there for hours. It's almost like you can feel something. Um, it's like in stone tapes. It's a timeless thing. Some places are beautiful, but I feel quite sad. Um, and there are probably places which it turned out to be the case in Scotland. They were actual ancient battlegrounds and stuff. Although the place is gorgeous, you kind of pick up on the vibe. So I wrote a song called Hear It With My Heart. And I stand by that and I live by that. You know, when I get a mistrust about someone, you know, it's, it's in your heart. When you think you're doing something right, you feel it. Uh, when you're picking up vibes, people or places. So it's all about that, really. Um, hence that song. That song was written in yes. honor. That, that song is that. quite quite moving as well. I've heard that song. Yeah, it's very moving. Yeah, a lot, a lot of people play. Well, Linda Dagenart, who lives over in the US, she, she plays it every day and every night, along with, coupled up with a song called Soul Journey. Yep. which is obviously about the, you know, the, the journey of the soul. So she plays them too. And I've known Linda now for about eight years, something, nine years. And every morning, every night, she involves those songs into her rituals, which kind of give it a credence and a strength for her. So I'm really flattered that someone is actually getting under the skin of the music, enjoying the words and actually being in, in there, you know, with what I'm saying and what it's about so you know it's it's quite good to know that some people are you know playing the music and studying it and understanding it it's not just a cheap thrill of listening and then yeah. on to the next thing some of the songs grow on people and, and that's really what they're about they're message songs sometimes i'm trying to sing and impress with a singing voice most of the time um i've just been diagnosed with like emphysema and copd so there's a notch down in my voice over the last couple of years but I can basically have a gravelly effect to my voice singing and probably end up talking them through. But I think as a song and a message, I think it'd still work even if I spoke the songs instead of singing them, you know? So yeah. they're, they're the kind of things. They're message songs. And they're about things that mattered to me. And it turns out, because they're very popular around the world in over 60 countries, they're, it's actually tapping into people you know, what they appreciate, what they like, what they've noticed and what and, they follow. And, and you know, that is something that speaks to 
true musicianship, you know, uh, and that's something that I aim for in my own music. I mean, even though I'm doing something completely different, <laughs> you know, I, I, I aim for people to want to analyze my lyrics and listen to what I'm saying, you know, and, and that's one of the reasons why I chose hip hop to be the genre of music that I mainly work around because there's a lot of areas to say things, you know, and I, I have to say, you know, like listening, listening to your music, like I said, like you get, you get taken to a place when you listen and you start listening to the words and analyzing the lyrics, you know, everything is very poetic and, you know, but it's also not hard to digest. You know, you can generally figure out what you're trying to say rather quickly. Um, yeah. And that's something that is also, I think, speaks to a lot of people and it helps people to want to analyze what you're saying and to get that feeling from your music. And, you know, you're in the, you got your hands in a lot of pots, I, I must say, you know, like we, we, we got the music thing and then, you know, this amazing artwork that, you know, I've seen all over the internet and stuff. And if you go on the, if you go on to the uh, Cronona's Rising website, there is a lot of artwork that is like hand drawn, absolutely amazing work. And so you're kind of a kind of a double threat in the in the, the arts world there. Um, so <laughs> do you want to talk about like about your art and, and about like how you got started, where you're going with that? And Yeah, yeah. I mean, to be honest, it's a, it's something that's not good. I mean, I'm I'm retired in this year by rights because of age, but I'm, I'm not going to retire because I think when people do retire after having a very, um, very active um, life, I think it's the kiss of death. I think when you slow down and stop, um, and I've, I've always, I've never worked for anyone. I've always worked for myself. Um, you know, and some of these projects I do for the charity and schools, they're massive projects, some of them. Um, and it will demand that you work a, a 15, 60 an hour day. But I've done that forever. And I think to stop from that, because you become like a high, like I, I, I have to paint murals 90 miles an hour because of the time deadlines. And I've just got a vest on and I'm dripping with sweat and I look like a racehorse with steam coming off me. And, and, and you've got to be careful. You don't burn out your volunteers. People that come along and help us, they're like, no, bugger that. You know, you work too long and too hard. But that's the way I've been. Um, from the times when we did the world's longest mural we got in the Guinness Book of Records. But we only did that because of high intensity work rate. And um, we went through many people. We built up many teams to give us a hand to do that. And we painted that one hospital, which was Europe's largest hospital. We painted that four times over, over about 40 years. Well, that artwork and that level and speed that we painted that, I don't know any better now. I mean, since COVID, there was a lockdown scenario where mm. not much was happening. We lost a lot of our projects. Um, I got diagnosed with a, a cancer situation. Um, so with COVID, losing the projects, staying in, and my mind turned on me instead of outwardly, creatively doing things, it really messed me up. It really could have caused some serious mental health conditions. So I've just dived back into work again. I'm getting busy. I've gone chasing more projects. So retirement isn't gonna, is not going to suit me. I need to carry on doing what I'm doing. The legacy is all the work that I've done is all over the UK and the Channel Isles. We've done untold amounts of projects and murals in big places, small places. And the small places, like a place called Zoe's Baby Hospice, Sunny Little, but if you think about how potent that is in my mind and the parents' minds of the children that are in this place, this is the last bus stop on earth for them. And the only thing, I'm not a doctor, I can't contribute in terms of know-how, medication, and that kind of thing, but I can. I can, and we do, improve the environments of these places, you know, for the parents' waiting rooms, to the wards where the babies and the children are, you know, um, and it's a big pill to swallow. We go in and out of these places. You get to know the children. 
they're painting with us because it's a bit of joy involved for them. And then you go in another month and then some of those kids have died and you're like, hmm. Yeah. And you get things in perspective and you can take people off the streets who think they're hard gangsters and, you know, well, I'll come and work with you and I'll do a little bit of charity and they're in tears. So they see a little bit of real life. You know, they're not on the street fighting. They're not stealing cars. They're not wondering where they're going to get drugs from and all the rest of the crap that goes with this ego-driven culture that we have now. They've lent themselves into real life and improving the environments for sick and disabled and terminally ill people and children, and they feel good about themselves. And then you know what? They don't hang around with the pack anymore. They hang around with us because we're the pack. Yeah. You know, we're doing something powerful. And sometimes we get grants, sometimes we don't get the money and get the grants, but we still go off and we still do these projects in Scotland, in London, and these people that were running feral on the streets and just being total assholes and plastic gangsters, and the first ones to say, can I come with you? I said, well, there's no wages. There's no expenses. There's no, it doesn't matter. The crack good. We like being there. We like doing what we do. And to me, the value of that is just as good as improving environments for the sick and disabled by doing vibrant murals, interactive murals for children who can't see properly and are profoundly affected with disabilities. We do textured murals. We build stars and fiber optic lights into them. So many facets to all the work we do. And we've moved into, Art for Their Sake has now moved into music and poetry. So we're pulling everything I know and everything I'm about from poetry to music to art to anything, sculpture. We do it all in a place on my land. And that place is called Communitas. And we've got the essence of it right. We've had a few nights with amazing music, amazing people. Uh, we've had people there who were breeding bees. There was workshops, showcases, art, fantastic food, camping, uh, drumming workshops, anything and everything I could feel that would make someone feel like they're in a cozy blanket, you know, by being with oh, us yeah. and being there. So it works. It's potent and it works. Um, and I'm looking to build on that again. See, that is just amazing work, you know, doing that kind of work in the community, you know, it, it really does, it really does make a difference and it touches a lot of people. And, you know, I want to thank you for doing that, even though I've never even set foot in the United Kingdom, <laughs> you know, I, I it, it's absolutely phenomenal what you're doing. So we're coming to the point here in our little, in our little chat where we're going to take a quick break, all right, and we're going to play a song, okay? okay, and we're going to show off a little bit of your artwork in this song and some of your album covers and photos and stuff. We're on a little slideshow and all of that, all right? So you guys enjoy this. This is The Witch's Tree, and we will be right back. <laughs> I sit beneath the witch's tree, the elder mother talks to me I journey to the other side, the fragrance takes me there Old lady standing wise and bent midsummer's night I breathe your scent, the other world so near so far So will you lift the veil? I sleep beneath the witch's tree Bright stones watch over me The fae they dance by full moonlight I watch them as they shine Breathe deep and drink a wine oh, Queen of herbs good fortune bring you mystic healing ways I sing to you I'll meet the fairy folk all dancing in a ring Old girl, give up thy sacred world and staff in one To me you should, for I will give you some of mine When I become a tree I sleep beneath the witch's tree The roller ice stones watch over me The fae, they dance by full
be standing wise in bed midsummer's night. Breathe your scent, you're the world so near, so far. I see beyond the veil. I sleep beneath the witch's tree. The roar I stones watch over me. The fae they dance by full moonlight. I watch them as they shine. Be deep and drink a wine. Right, we are back, everybody, and that was the Witch's Tree. Excellent track. Um, it's a, like I said, this music just takes you places, guys. And uh, you know, I mean, I find myself just closing my eyes and just taking it all in, you know. And so, I want you guys to comment below what you think of that song, definitely. Um, and let us know, absolutely. So, George, I got, I got something that you know i was that we 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 just talked about off the air and i i just have to bring it up because it's one of the most awesome things i think i may have ever seen in my life so please let's go on about the wear bears because this is oh my god it's just they're just so amazing (laughs) yeah okay um they were a toy concept and a concept i've written and a comic concept that i drew and put out there like you know publish it myself basically but this is a, a folder that i used to put the comics in so that's the name <laughs> Where it is. Um, so awesome. four four of them and they had four enemies which were the terror teds um it's just my imagination the terror teds this terror-teds this is a bad news this is a where bear the, the actual concept is that they turn from cute and you turn the head inside out and the paws inside out so they have claws and it they turn into this kind of thing <laughs> they're so awesome <laughs> so again that started off with um first an idea and then you bring things through into the universe started drawing them down in two dimension and making them into models and then i licensed the idea to homey toys they're the world famous homey toys in london that way who used to make train sets all around the world and they'd moved into plush toys cuddly toys so i went to see them and i talked them into buying a license from me to make the werebears um and they were an instant success and then we had to make more of them and they just sold millions of them all over the place i did the the comic um in a shed with a few friends i said to them look guys this is catching on come down I give some of my artists that worked on the mural projects with me some felt tip pens. So I was drawing all the werebears, doing all the comic strips. They were coloring them in. So we, we never moved out of that shed in a previous house I worked in. We just stayed in there slaving away and produced some really good, good comics, good storylines. And on each one, we sold over 100,000. So then we had the publishers in the UK wanting to take it off us. But I'd already been to see these guys, and because Werebears were not on TV, they didn't want to know. When they found out we were selling in excess of 100,000, and these things were flying around the globe, selling to people, they're knocking on the door, wanted to come in. So I was like, no, I've got it sewn up, trademarks, patents, copyright. We're doing it ourselves, i.e. cottage industry, but it was taken away by storm. It was doing a really good job. So we stayed on our own. A little skeleton crew and um yeah we banged them out there so but that was that was 28 30 years ago what i really like is the fact that we still have a massive fan club 
the, these were bears now of on eBay, they, they become collector's items. Of some of these are going for like three hundred pounds, six hundred pounds, and in sets, some people have the original boxes. Um, Carla, who runs my website, she says to me every other day, "Oh, people keep sending drawings in. They remember the werebears." And someone from Mexico the other day has a massive, well, a massive tattoo of this guy Grizzler on the, on a thigh, and then somebody else in Europe had a, a massive one on the shoulder. Uh, of, of the blue one called Howler. So there's some dedicated, devoted fans out there who really love the werebears. Um, and that, to bring them back, what's more in my power, because you can't get a telly and you can't just go and get a toy deal, um, is probably to produce a couple of books, story books. Um, even if you open the book up and it howls, some novelty factor going on um, of the original old story of the werebears and how they come into being. So I'm in the mo I'm in the motions right now. We're going to put a website up. We're going to um, and try and launch a series of different types of books of werebears and bring them back. We have to get the werebears back. That that I mean I don't know for for all the viewers out there. While while he was just talking about the things, if anybody just took a minute to look at my face while we were going through here, I am absolutely elated by this idea. I just. Like it's so awesome. I mean, you know, I'm first off, I'm I'm a sucker for you know like, you know, kids kids toys and anime and stuff like that. And I and I always have been. You know, like I'm huge like Transformers fan and all of that stuff. Like, and so like this like Were Bears idea. I'm like yes, this yeah. is phenomenal. And I'm just telling everybody out there, let's get the Were Bears back because that just sounds like an awesome thing that needs to be a thing nowadays. Because. <laughs> I mean, it's well, we had huge. We, just before the end of the licensing period after three years, it, it got me over to LA. I went to see Universal Studios and we actually got in a riff about it, but they were fighting over them. They wanted all the merchandise and deals that were in place first, but they were after them for a, about nine months. Um, and I thought, great, you know, and it was worth 45 million and all this rubbish. Well, it was a rubbish, <laughs> a good thing, I suppose, but yeah. I didn't like some of the components in the contract, which were a little bit dubious. And because I pulled them up with my lawyers, it led to a lot of embarrassments. Um, and I wouldn't shift. And they were trying to insist on something basically to where at the end of the marketing period, the copyright became theirs. I would have lost them. I would have made a lot of money along the way. But we ended up getting into big rounds about it. But the werebears got me to America a few times in terms of, because obviously it's a massive market oh, yeah. and there's nowhere better, you know, Universal Studios or the likes of Disney Pixar. You know, I've got a film script for these guys. Um, it's just that I burnt out merchandising them, flying around, publishing them. So I, was much also, work. I was also publishing Scouse Mouse. I also had a comic called Wanted, which had Budgie Malone and Al Capone. It was an owl gangster and a budgie gangster set in Chicago with Elliot Nestegg. And it was all bad, crazy shit. It was mad. And that comic sold massively as well. So I had my cartoon years and um, got all my silly creativity out, you know, and then I kind of then I kind of drifted into the music then. But I do miss I do miss doing the cartoons. Oh, that's really. so, so great, though. I mean, so those those ideas are so fresh, too. You know what I mean? Like. As, I, I think it's amazing. So, so what's the plan now? You know, we, 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 I mean, you've, you've pretty much touched all the bases, haven't you? You know, like you've done the cartooning and the art, you've done the poetry, you've done the music, you got five albums out, you know, like all of this, these things that you're involved in. I mean, what's next for George Nicholas? Like, I, I, I fancy having a little go at knitting, you know, pressing wildflowers. Yeah. Why not? Right. No, I'm a little, little crocheting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can make canonis cloaks. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm just thinking, same old. Um, maybe go and find somewhere and try and paint the world's longest mural again. Maybe, and well, definitely bring the werebears back out, if only as a book, because I know it will do well around the world. So I should really move my ass quickly, bring the werebears out in various publications. I'm going to stick with the music. I'm starting to do um, a sixth album now. Um, there's two songs down on that one. But 
again, I don't want to burn out like I always used to do. Mm. You know, um, I think having the wake up call with the health, um, the emphysema, the cancer, and all that, um, it, it isn't good for me to sit in a house dwelling on that. I It's like having a Ferrari and leaving it in the carriage to just go rusty. I need to be razzing about. I need to be doing things, you know, with inspiration and creativity and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. And hopefully it rubs off on other people. And that, that's a real pleasure to see other people joining in on some of the ideas, you know, especially the communitas thing that Absolutely. we have got going now. So I'm, definitely going to be doing, I'm definitely going to be doing a few of those nights again. That, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so definitely go to this man's website and check out what he's got going on at chrononosrising.com. It's so wonderful. You'll find a link in the description and you'll find links to find him pretty much anywhere that you wish to find, be it the art, be it the music. And then, you know, as soon as I see a werebears thing pop up on the internet, I'm, I'm already on the promotional team for that one. Uh, so I will definitely make sure that I have that up there as well, pretty much immediately. Um, and yeah, is there, is there anything else you'd like to say to the audience before we, uh, before we close things up? Um, with me, with me moving full circle back into cartoons now, um, again, if I'm going to do the book, I'm going to illustrate and do cartoons. So I'm moving back into this. So I've just put a website up. It's georgenicholas.co.uk. Um, cartoons. It's, it's just George Nicholas, you know, .co.uk. Um, we have canonisrising.com. Um, we've got art for their sake t-h-e-i-r art for their sake dot com that's the charity there's also some professional murals that i do got a professional mural company we do really big posh mansions and massive shopping malls like a place called the trafford center in manchester and it's it's probably about 100 foot up in the air so there's all kinds of um classic murals like from ancient Rome. We do all that stuff as well. So that's up there. So there's an impactmurals.com, impact murals. Some people put murials, I don't know why. M-U-R-A-L-S. So there's a few, and there's uh, my Facebook, which is a bit of a mishmash. There's all kinds of stuff on that. So I suppose there's um, things to interest a lot of people in different um, different directions, you know. So I've got enough websites up and about at the moment. Feel like I'm balancing plates on sticks. There's too many things going on. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I hear you on that. I definitely do. But it's all amazing work. I mean, you're definitely hitting it on the head, as far as I can see it. So I want to thank you for coming on and talking to me. It's been a very, very, uh, very eye-opening conversation, and you know, it's left me and I'm sure the audience a lot to think about. And it's also been a wonderful thing to get to know get to know you and you know what it is that you're doing and all the different things that you're involved with especially the charity because that is absolutely phenomenal work with the community that you're doing and you know i can't i can't stress that enough you know yeah. as as awesome as the the wear bears are aside that charity it really is i mean that's putting in you know putting in the goddess's work right there it is it is absolutely amazing I, I i see that as my life's work really so that it is important to me that Yes, absolutely. So thank you for stopping by and talking with me and taking the time out to do so. I know you're a very busy man, so I won't take up any more of your time. Everybody definitely go and check this out. Okay. I'm going to leave everything in the description and until next time, guys, just remember whatever you're going through out there, you got this. All right. So I'm cloud with international pagan radio, bright blessings. Blessed be y'all. <laughs>